Hello everyone, it is time once again for Scripture Verse by Verse Radio. My name is Michael Moret, and today we are in the book of Philippians, actually going to conclude our study in Philippians today. We are in Philippians chapter 4, and we will resume our study in verse number 1. So if it is possible for you to follow along in your own Bible, that would be wonderful. You always get more out of these studies if you look at the Word of God, because that's the most important thing. Read it along with me, and we'll study it verse by verse together. Now, before I forget, I want to tell you about the Scripture Verse by Verse website, because if you go there at thebibleversebyverse.com, you will be able to study the entire Bible online for free using my audio Bible commentaries because I've been through the Bible every single verse from Genesis through Revelation taught through the whole thing twice on my third journey right now so go to the Bible verse by verse dot com not right now after we're done studying today and study the Word of God guaranteed good time if you love the Word so let's pray Father we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth your word is truth in Jesus name Amen. The Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Boy, I'll tell you, Paul sure liked these people, didn't he? He doesn't talk this way to any other group, any other church that he ever wrote to. I think he loved all Christians. I'm sure he did, but, you know, a lot of other Christians, groups, they were churches, they were giving him a, a hard time. They were really a pain to him, but not the Philippians. He sure did like them. And I suppose it was a pleasure to lead Christians who were not a continual pain in the neck to you. And that's what many were to him from other places. And, uh, what do you know? They actually did care about the Apostle Paul, and that seemed like it was a rare thing, too. What a nice change of pace that was for him. Verse 2, I urge Eudeus and urge Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, these two ladies evidently were not getting along very well, and uh, the Apostle Paul has a Holy Spirit inspired solution to that problem and it's really not very complicated they, they didn't need to go in for counseling for six months or check into a psychological clinic which I'm afraid many churches today would tell them to do um, if they focused on Jesus Christ if they if they put their efforts their time and their energy into drawing close to Jesus then he will control their minds and as a result they're going to get along just fine because the things whatever it is that they're arguing about will just fall by the wayside verse 3 and I entreat you also true yoke fellow help those women who labored with me in the gospel with Clement also and with other of my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life in other words Paul says help those who have helped me and again that was a rare thing to find somebody who was actually helping Paul most people took advantage of him and he was willing to be taken advantage of as long as he was serving Jesus Christ but he says help those who have helped me and that's a biblical principle that God would like every Christian to live by. Help those who help get out the Word of God. Help those. If a Christian helps you in some way, don't just drink it in like a bloodsucker, like a leech, without helping them out as well. It should be a two-way two street. If someone is blessing you, if somebody is a blessing to you, then bless them back. And I would suggest that you do it quickly before you get busy and then you forget. 
Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Any chance that you get, and Paul says this a lot, doesn't he? In his epistles, we just see this over and over again. But any chance that you get throughout the day, give some praise and some worship and thanks to God. I mean, you don't have to do it out loud. Think it to God. He'll appreciate it, but just be aware of that. Rejoice in the Lord always. Verse 5. Let your fairness be known unto all men. In other words, you're a Christian. Always do what is right. Always do what is fair so that you have a reputation for being that way because that will reflect well on Jesus. Whoever, whenever, whenever someone is unfair, you can, you can pretty much figure that something sneaky and underhanded is going on somewhere. And so be fair, be good. Verse five or verse six, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Don't be anxious about anything. Don't worry, in other words, about anything. You do know that worry is a sin, don't you? That's what the Bible teaches. So don't worry about anything. You say, well, I've got problems. I, I've got things that I'm concerned about. Well, of course. You're living in a lousy world. But if something concerns you, this is what you do. You pray about it. Okay? And then you trust God with the answer, whatever it might be. Not having an agenda of your own. Just trust God with whatever the answer might be according to his perfect will. That's the answer to worry. That's how you combat worry. Verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So pray about everything. And make sure your prayers include thanksgiving for everything. Because, because not, not only because it's right to thank God for everything, but also because it cements the reality of God's sovereignty in our minds, which will help us to trust him and it will give us peace instead of that anxiousness that we're told not to have. So when you give thanks to Jesus for everything, even for the things that you don't like, you don't have to tell God that you like him because that's lying. But just by faith, thank God for everything. You, to, you pray about it, you maybe ask God to change it, and even while you're asking God to change it, by faith, thank him for it. Thank you that you have allowed this to happen. I don't understand why, but I thank you by faith. Because that really is a way of acknowledging his sovereignty. Turning it over to him. That's doing something tangible to turn your problem over to him. And that'll go a long way in giving you peace regardless of what your circumstances might be and that's what he says right here notice the, the end result of that verse 7 and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ so there you have it pray about everything thank God for everything and you're going to have so much peace that it's not even going to make sense to you or anyone else. It's the peace of God that passes all understanding. And you know what that's talking about. When it says that, that you will have the peace of God, that means you're going to have the same peace that God has. You think God is worried about anything? You think God lays awake all night, wondering what's going to happen, all concerned, biting his divine fingernails? I don't think so. And when you pray and you give everything over to him and you thank him by faith for everything and you trust him with the answer, you're going to have the same peace that God has. See, God knows 
that everything's going to work out. He doesn't fret over anything. He's, he's got all power, he, and everything's going to work out, and he's good, and everything's going to be good in the end. And when you trust God, you can have that same peace. Everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to work out in the end. <clears throat> Verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. We can't hide our heads in the sand, as it were, pretending that there isn't bad in the world. But we shouldn't dwell on the bad stuff either. Now, we've already learned how to handle it. Acknowledge that it's there. Live in reality. Pray about it. Trust God to deal with it. And then think about good stuff. Think about God's stuff. Think about righteousness. Think about the positive things in life. Because what we think determines how we behave. And so let goodness and righteousness and virtue be the rudder that directs your life. You know, the ingredients in the mixing bowl determine the cake. And the ingredients that you put in your mind and that you dwell on in your mind determine your attitude and your actions and your words. As a man thinks in his heart, the Bible says, so is he. Verse 9, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. I think the most important word in this entire verse is the word do. Paul knew that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul knew that he was following Jesus with all of his heart, which made him a good example for other Christians to follow. And that's all wonderful. He taught the Word of God. He lived the Word of God. And so he's telling Christians, you know what you see in me. You know what you've heard me talk about. It's all the Word of God. So now do it. Do it, and the God of peace will be with you. And that's the key word, do. You can, you can have a horrible headache, and you can go and buy a bottle of aspirin, extra strength. But if the aspirin just stays in the bottle, or you lay it out on the cupboard and you look at it, your headache's not going to go away. You have to take it. And it's the same in the spiritual realm. A lot of Christians own a Bible. A lot of Christians even read their Bible. But how many Christians apply what they learn? How many Christians live it? If you don't do it, you're not going to be blessed. If you don't do it, you're not going to have peace. Verse 10, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me has flourished again, in which you were also concerned, but you lacked opportunity. The Philippians were good people, you know, good Christians. And as we have seen, they certainly had a heart for Paul because they had a heart for the Word of God and they had a heart for God. And they wanted to send Paul an offering, evidently for a long, long time, but they just couldn't. I guess they just didn't have it. Until now. So now they sent it. And Paul was very happy in the Lord. He was very happy that they were able to do it. Primarily because, of course, it honors God. But also because it made them happy. Because the Bible says it's blessed, more blessed to give 
than it is to receive. And people who just constantly take, and their Christianity is a one-way street where they just take and take and take, and they fill up with the Word of God, and they fill up with blessings from others, but they never give it back. They're not happy. Verse 10. He says, But I rejoice greatly that now at the last your care of me has flourished again, in which you were also concerned, but you lacked opportunity. Again, Paul was most happy because it made the Philippians happy that they were able to partner with him in getting out the word of God. Verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. See, Paul found his contentment in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is why he did not chase after the things of the world, the things which the world chases after and worldly Christians chase after to try to get some sort of a short-term buzz to get them through the day to try to find a measure of happiness. He didn't chase after that stuff. He didn't need to chase after stuff to give him happiness. He had it. And he had contentment in Jesus Christ. And so he says in verse 12, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. See, Paul was uh, consistent in his joy. And that's because he didn't seek happiness in the things of this world, which are hit and miss at best. Man, if you're looking for happiness in the things of this world, you're going to be up and down like a yo-yo as far as your joy and happiness is concerned. So let's say you, you really think that if you can just get a new car, you're going to be real happy. Well, so you get a new car and it starts having, you start having problems with it, then you're not happy. Or you, or you take your car to Walmart or someplace, and you go and you get some grocery, and you come out, there's a scratch on it. And you just bought it. I mean, if you're counting on the things of the world to make you happy, forget it. You're going to be inconsistent at best. But the Apostle Paul found something consistently good to hang his hat on for the sake of joy. Look at 13. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There's the key. Right there. Jesus made up for any bad in Paul's life, and Jesus was infinitely better than any good in his life. So Jesus was his focus. And that's why he had the joy of the Lord, and it was consistent, regardless of what his circumstances were. Verse 14. Nevertheless, you have done well that you did share in my afflictions. Well, you know, just because Paul learned the secret to living with a lot and, and with very little or nothing, that doesn't mean that he didn't appreciate what the Philippian Christians did for him. It was nice. It was very nice of the Philippians to give Paul an offering and God did work through it because God works through Christians to bless other Christians he used it to help Paul and help get out the word of God no doubt about it see the Philippians are going to be blessed because they help get out the word Paul was blessed because he was the one who was helped and God was blessed because both of them both the Philippians and the Apostle Paul were doing this for the glory of God. So everybody was being blessed because everybody was following the leading of the Holy Spirit. Verse 15. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. And that's, that's pathetic. But you know what? I'm kind of surprised that it was that way back then, because I think I mentioned this last time, sometimes when you think of the first century Christians, you know, you, you think of them as being super saints, so close to the time of Christ that they've got to be on fire for Jesus. They've got to have their priorities 
you know, straight. But that really wasn't the case. And usually, the way it was here, that's the way it is today, too. Many people are blessed. And many people are fed by the Word of God. But only a relatively few understand that it's wrong to expect something from nothing and therefore they support those who faithfully teach it's a small percentage that help keep ministries going most Christians just take 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 soak it up like a sponge and never even think of giving verse 16 for even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity so the Philippians were givers they had a heart for God and that's why they gave it's like Jesus said where your treasure is that's where your heart is also they had a heart for God and that's why they helped to get out the word of God they helped Paul in any way that they possibly could verse 17 not because I desire a gift but I desire fruit that may abound to your account Paul God used their money and Paul appreciated their money but he didn't count on it he didn't trust in it if you're a preacher and you're trusting in the offerings of people man I have learned you can't do that you have to trust in God to meet your needs for as long as he wants you to do what he has called you to do and so Paul appreciated their offering but he's especially happy because they would be they would be rewarded for doing it God is not God is not oblivious to anything that you give a ministry that is getting out the word of God and so that's what Paul is saying man your gift abounded to your account that's what really blesses me you know when you give to a minister who is teaching the word of God you are sharing in that ministry and according to the word of God you will share in that Bible teachers reward if you give to somebody who is what well, name the gift whatever it might be then you are sharing in that person's ministry and you will receive that person's reward that's what the Bible teaches so he says not because I desire a gift but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. Well, now, that, you know, his definition of all and abound is a lot different than most Christians today. Because there were times when he was hungry. And he wrote this from prison. And he just sent the one guy who was supplying his needs up to the Philippians to help them out, Epaphrodites. And yet he still says, I have all and I abound. You know why that is? It's because God says, my God, the Bible says, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Paul had everything that he needed. He wasn't living in luxury, believe me. But he had everything that he needed. So he said, I abound. I'm full. Verse 18, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. So Epaphroditus delivered the gift and that made Paul's day. And then he says this, just what I quoted, 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Whatever you need, God will give you. He doesn't give you what you want. He may not give you what the people down the street have. If you're looking to keep up with the Joneses and have a nice big house like they have, Right? because you don't want to feel beneath them well then you got a problem God's not going to supply that for you he, he doesn't promise to supply that for you I mean you might work your tail off and ignore the most important things in life to get stuff like that but you know God doesn't promise to give you what you want he doesn't promise to give you you know luxuries in life but he will give you all that you need for as long as he wants you to live Verse 20, now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And that's because he supplies all of our needs. Temporal needs, 
most of all our spiritual needs, our eternal needs, by allowing his son to come to earth, be born a baby, live a sinless life, die on a cross, and pay for our sins so that we don't have to go to hell. To God be the glory. Because we would hopeless, be hopelessly lost if he had not done that. 21. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you. Chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. Stop there for a second. I told you, I don't know if it was in the book of Philippians or when we were in Ephesians. I think we were in Ephesians because he wrote that epistle to the Ephesians when he was in jail too. And I told you at that time that, well, we saw that Paul said that he was a prisoner of Christ. And I, and I mentioned that Paul said that. And he had peace, no matter what his situation was, even being locked up in prison for simply preaching the word of God, because he saw Jesus in his problems. He saw the fingerprints of Jesus. He knew that there was, if God had him in a situation, it was for him to do something that he otherwise could not do. And you see the fruit of it right here. He says, all the saints greet you. Okay, the saints. Well, who, who are the saints? Who, who do they include? Uh, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. So he was chained to a prison guard. They were constantly looking at him, watching over him, guarding him, and they ended up getting saved. You know, what chance would these prison guards have had of getting saved if Paul had not been arrested on trumped up charges, basically, simply for, for preaching the word of God? So you see how God works all things together for good. If God has you in a situation that, that you don't like, stay filled with the Spirit of God and look for a way to serve Jesus in the midst of that situation that you could not otherwise serve Him. Look for Jesus in your problems. And look at this. Souls were being saved. Because wherever Paul was, whatever his circumstances were, he lived for Jesus, and he talked about Jesus, and he talked about the Word of God, and people can't help but get saved, some anyway, when that goes on. 23, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And if you want to study the Word of God further, as I said at the beginning of our program, you can do that at thebibleversebyverse.com. Go to the BibleVerseByVerse.com. Click on the book of the Bible you want to study. All 66 books are there, twice over. Click on the book you want to study. I always suggest the book of Genesis. Start there. And listen to my audio Bible commentaries. It's going to take you a while because these are not chapter-by-chapter chapter, uh, studies or book-by-book book surveys. Not at all. This is verse-by-verse verse stuff. It's going to take you a while to get through the 31,000 plus verses in the English Bible. But it'll bless you. Not because I teach it. It'll bless you because it's the Word of God and we need to study the entirety of the Word of God. So do that. Just click on the book you want to study, open up your Bible, listen, follow along as I teach it verse by verse, just like we did today. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. And if you want to give to this ministry, if you've been blessed, just remember that this program is brought to you by your tithes and your offerings. So if you've been blessed, I would appreciate it very much if you would bless us back. We're not underwritten by any large denomination or large church. This is a faith ministry that I've been doing for 30 years. You don't get through the Bible twice, verse by verse, unless you do it for a long time. So if you've been blessed, I'd appreciate you bless us back. And you can do it online right at thebibleversebyverse.com. Front page, just click on the donate button and give in a secure method by PayPal. Or if you want to contact us the old-fashioned way, you can. Our mailing address is Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wausau, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. Again, Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wausau, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. Dash two two one one. As always, great, great time being in the Word, isn't it? Isn't that fun? If you're a Christian, don't you just love the Word of God? 
nothing I would rather do, and I especially like it when you're here with me and we're sharing the Word of God together. So, love to hear from you, and I'll see you next time in the book of Colossians. Until then, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.